Welcome to the joint celebration. There. Welcome to the joint celebration, a partnering of the England Valley Storytellers and the Asian American Storytellers in Action. My name is John St. Clair, and I will be your Zoom host today. I also happen to be the leader of the Inland Valley Storytellers, and I will be the MC for the Inland Valley Storytellers, and I'm also a storyteller as well, wearing many hats. So I want to say a little bit about um, the uh, ground rules for this. We want all of our listeners to be muted, and um, I actually... Um, see some that are, are un, that are unmuted and I can go through or uh, my co-host can go through and mute those who aren't muted yet. And please stay muted. Uh, if you have like a, a question or a comment, you can put that in the chat box. Uh, and after all the stories are over, we'll let people unmute and the story listeners can ask the storytellers questions and vice versa. And so... Um, the other thing is, if you are doing something in front of your computer, you don't want people to um, see, stop the video as well. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about the Inland Valley Storytellers. Uh, we were formed in 2003, and uh, that year we did a celebration. We've done a celebration every year since. Starting in 2020, we started doing the joint celebrations that SAC, Storytelling Association of California, organized. And that's been a lot of fun, and we are delighted to partner with the Asian American Storytellers in Action this year. And uh, we meet in a story monthly story swap the second Tuesday of every month, and uh, it is a hybrid meeting in person and on Zoom. For a couple of years during COVID, we did only Zoom meetings, but now we're back to doing live as well. And so what I'd like to do now is um, introduce the uh, MC for the Asian American Storytellers in Action. Bowen Lian Lee divides her time between cities, forests, and the ocean around Monterey, California. She has been a teacher, a writer, an illustrator, and now she tells stories, incorporating storytelling into all aspects of teaching. She conducts workshops in storytelling to teach educational content in national and regional educational conferences, and she is a fifth-generation Chinese-American of Gold Rush ancestry. Please welcome Bowen Lee. Yeah, and I need to... Spotlight and take. Thank you, John. <clears throat> That's wonderful. Okay, so I'm going to read the proclamation for a celebration, as this is the first celebration in the nation. All right, here we go. Celebration, proclamation, in the name of storytelling, Saturday, November 11th, 2023, is hereby proclaimed to be celebration. The worldwide event of storytelling on this very day in 40 states and eight countries, from Walnut Creek to Monterey, Boise to Barcelona, West Virginia to West Indies, Olympia to Claremont, over 300 audiences are gathered for the spectacular storytelling event. Without further delay, in joy and in anticipation, let the stories begin. Oops. <laughs> Welcome everyone to our joint celebration for Inland Valley Tellers and Asian American Storytellers in Action. Our storytelling group, Asian American Storytellers in Action, is composed of storytellers from all parts of the country who are Asian American or Asian li living in the United States. 
We originally came together during the pandemic to rally around Asian American Pacific Islanders, give our support to all those affected by Asian hate racism. We're still going strong with our YouTube channel for young people, Asian American Storytopia, which I will put in the chat, the link for it in the chat for you. So our first storyteller from Asian American Storytellers in Action is Rupa Mohan, a storyteller from Walnut Creek, California, first trained at the Asian Art Museum in San Francisco to tell folk tales and myths to school groups. She now enjoys sharing different genres of stories with adults as well, often braiding her childhood memories from India into them. Rupa serves on the board of the Storytelling Association of California, leading a project to bring stories to underserved schools. And Rupa is a newly minted Chautauqua scholar and debuted her portrayal of Kasturba Gandhi. Ah, she's fabulous too. So her story today is ancient wisdom about the origin of the Panchantantra tales. Rupa. Namaste, greetings everyone. Uh, this is a very special weekend. It's the weekend of Diwali, our festival of lights. And today I want to take you back over 2000 years when in a kingdom in India, they were celebrating Diwali and everybody was happy lighting lamps like this and uh, feasting. But the king was rather distraught. You see, he said, Diwali is supposed to be a time of light over darkness, knowledge over ignorance. But look at my three children, my young boys. They have no interest in gaining knowledge or learning how to be kings. What am I going to do after my time? What's going to happen here? Well, his minister reassured him and said, I will take care of that, your majesty. The next day, he brought with him a tall man with a long gray beard wearing a saffron robe. A man who had sparkling eyes and a very gentle manner. This is Vishnu Sharma, your majesty. He is a teacher. I know many teachers have come and gone, but I think he will be able to teach the young princess. Well, the king was desperate and he, of course, welcomed this scholar and teacher Vishnu Sharma and the next day under a big banyan tree on the beautiful grounds of the palace the three young princes were brought and introduced to this teacher. He immediately sat them down and before they could start fidgeting or running away like they usually did with their other tutors he started telling them stories. Perhaps the first story was about a lazy and hungry crocodile that was found in a beautiful river in a dense forest. Well, the crocodile was bored and as soon as a young elephant came to drink water from that river, the crocodile went towards the elephant and immediately caught his foot. Oh, cried the elephant who had strayed away from his mother. Now next to that river was beautiful mango tree filled with luscious ripe mangoes and a monkey was swinging 
and happened to look upon the scene. The monkey immediately plucked the juiciest golden ripe mango and dropped it down. And guess what? The crocodile let go of the elephant's foot and grabbed that mango and started biting into it. It had after all craved those mangoes which were so high above and unreachable. And now the crocodile was delighted to get the mango. The elephant walked away to safety and to join his mother. That was the first story. And the young princess, they were intrigued. They wanted more. They sat there as the palace grounds transformed into a beautiful jungle in their imagination, filled with all kinds of birds and animals. And the animals were talking and they were telling stories in their own words. And the princess, the three irresponsible young boys were now entranced by this old storyteller. The days went by, the months went by, and there was a feast of stories that were told, that they engaged in, and that they discussed at the end of every day. And the king, to his great delight, saw his boys transform. They were becoming more knowledgeable. They were starting to ask questions. And these simple tales were sparking their imagination. And at the end of six months, the king asked the teacher, Vishnu Sharma, to stay on and be the royal tutor. But Vishnu Sharma had told them all his stories and he was not interested in settling down. After all, he was a storyteller who wanted to spread his stories far and wide, bringing joy to other young people. So he left. But these stories came to be compiled and known as the Pancha Tantra. Pancha means five and Tantra means treaties. And somewhere along the way, these stories were written down in the ancient Sanskrit language. And they started traveling. Yes, stories traveled. Perhaps on the Silk Road, they must have traveled on horses, on camels, with traders. They must have traveled with the monks, the pilgrims who walked the Silk Road to carry religions like Buddhism. They traveled from Asia to Europe and beyond. They even traveled via the maritime routes on the boats and ships of traders who stopped at different ports. And wherever the stories landed, they got the local flavor and they transformed a little bit, but they were told and they were spread. The Pancha Tantra must have been chiseled on the rocks over these big kingdoms in Asia. They must have been written on palm leaves, copper plates, and then fabrics and early papers. Well, there was another story that traveled far and wide. The story about the lion who was undoubtedly the lord of the jungle and every day he wanted a prey to be delivered to him. He was getting too lazy to go out and hunt 
And it was time for the rabbit to be sent as his dinner. Now this rabbit was a clever young chap. He came to the hungry lion who was getting ready to grab him and said, Wait, 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 your majesty. I would love to be your prey, but there is one thing that has been disturbing me. As I came down, I noticed a big well. And when I looked down in the well, was a bigger lion than you. And much more fierce. And he was boasting that he was the lord of the jungle. And I said, how can that be? When you, sire, are the lord. And we are all here to come and pay our respects to you. Well, this lion was intrigued and angered. Ah, how can there be one bigger and better than me? Take me to him right away. And so they went. The rabbit leading the big lion. And they came to this large well. The rabbit said, look down, your majesty. Here he is. The lion looked down. And he roared. And he heard a roar that even that was even louder than this. It was echoing from that well. And the lion he saw looked so fierce and angry. He said, wait, I am going to get you right now. And he jumped into the well, never to be seen again. The rabbit hopped away to safety. Well, as the Panchatantra story spread, they were written in many languages. Manuscripts were painted with these beautiful animals and birds being represented. And the Panchatantra became like a reference guide when children had to be educated about different topics like how to make good friends, how to avoid bad situations, how to be better citizens, how to be more compassionate, and how to be better leaders and rulers. That is exactly what the three young princes had got from the Panchatantra. Well, I like one story that I think is very relevant, even in this day and age. And that is about the mouse bride. You might have come across a different version of it from different Asian countries, but this perhaps was the original. Well, it is said that long, long ago, a sage or a holy man was one day praying by the banks of a holy river and had his palms out like this when he was doing oblations. Suddenly, something from above fell into it. A mouse that had been dropped by a hawk by mistake. The mouse landed, was shaking with fear, and the holy man, he soothed the mouse and was wondering what to do with her when he had a brilliant idea. He and his wife had been longing for a child, and this might solve the problem. He whispered, a special magical chant into the mouse's ear. And soon she transformed into a beautiful little baby girl. He took the girl home and his wife was so happy and so grateful. And they raised her with all the love in the world. When she became a teenager and was ready to get married as a 
happened those days. Of course, they wanted the best bridegroom in the entire world for her. And so they went first to the sun, the brilliant sun, and they asked if he would like to become her groom. The sun agreed, but she said, Oh no, father, the sun is too hot and too bright for me. And then the sun suggested the cloud. The cloud covers me and plays hide and seek with me. The cloud may be a good one for your daughter. So the young girl said, Oh, no, no, father. The cloud sometimes gets very gray and cold and I don't think it will work out. The cloud said, Hmm, perhaps the wind... That scatters me all over. Hmm. Well, they went to the wind. The wind, of course, was ready. But the girl said, No, father, the wind is too unstable for me. Well, unstable? Hmm. Maybe the mountain would work for her, said the wind. So they went to a big, tall mountain. And they approached him. The mountain was ready, of course. But the girl said, No, father, the mountain is way too big for me and too strong and uh, too stable. Well, the mountain said, Hmm, how about the little mouse? Yes, there is a mouse king and his entire family living here, going in and out, tunneling their way through me. So the father approached the mouse king. And as soon as the girl saw him, she got red with excitement and all her hair stood up. Yes, she said, father, how handsome he looks. He may be the right one for me. The father knew what was in her heart. So he immediately chanted the secret chant again into her ear. And the beautiful girl transformed into her, her original mouse form again. And both the mice were married. And they lived happily ever after. Well, I love that story. And I hope you all will look into the Panchatantra stories and pick your favorite one. Just as those three young boys had learnt and enjoyed the Panchatantra stories from that ancient storyteller thousands of years ago. Namaste and thank you. Thank you. That was wonderful, wonderful stories. And uh, now I'm going to take the uh, spotlight off of her and add it to our next storyteller. Walter Roth. Walter Roth is retired after teaching elementary school for 36 years. Walt got his start telling stories by entertaining fellow backpackers in the wilderness. I first heard Walt tell stories on mule pack trips that we were on together. This joint celebration is his first time to tell in a celebration, and we are looking forward to it. And I'll remove my spotlight. Whoops, he's muted. How's that? Am I coming through? Okay, now we, now we can hear you. All right. This is the story of Stone Fox. But it might be more accurate to say it's the story of Little Willie. Now, Willie was a 10-year-old boy, and he was a little small for his size, for his age, as his name suggests. 
but he was mighty strong and pretty tough. And it's a good thing because he had to be. He lived outside of a tiny town on a little potato farm in Wyoming in the year 1903. Life was tough. And what made it even tougher was that he only had his grandfather and his dog, Searchlight, to help him. Now, Searchlight was a Siberian husky. And she was... Uh, She was called Searchlight because she had a white spot on the middle of her forehead, which reminded Willie of a searchlight. And he loved that dog more than anything. And she loved him. Well, one morning, Willie went in to wake up Grandpa. He found that Grandpa was awake, but something was wrong. Grandpa couldn't talk and he wasn't moving so good. He called in Doc Smith, and, she, and Doc Smith said, I'm sorry, Willie, but Grandpa's had a thing called a stroke. And that means from now on, you're going to have to do the work around here. And Willie did it. But his first big job was to get in the potato harvest. He did it, but he would never had worked so hard in his whole life. He got the crop in, got it into market, and got paid. He took the cash home. Well, it wasn't a lot, but it was enough to get him through the winter, if he was careful. He went to put it in a little metal box that Grandpa kept under the bed. When he opened the box, he was surprised to see that there wasn't any money in it, just a stack of letters from the bank. He wasn't sure what to make of it, so he asked Mr. Strickland at the bank what it meant. He explained to Willie that Grandpa had borrowed money and had never paid it back. And that if he didn't get the money back by spring, the bank was going to take the farm away. And they would all have to move someplace else. Well, that whole idea terrified Willie. He spent weeks trying to think of some way to raise the money. Then, in town, he saw a poster. The poster said, Big dog sled race, grand prize, $500. $500, he thought. That would be enough to pay back the bank and save the farm. So he went right in to sign up for the race. But Mr. Dingle in the store said, oh, Willie, don't try that. You'll be racing against grown men with full dog teams. And what's more, I heard that Stone Fox is going to be in this race. Whoa, Stone Fox. <sighs> Willie had heard about him. He had a reputation. He had a reputation for being a very big, very angry, and kind of dangerous Native American who always carried a rifle. He also carried a grudge. You see, his land had been taken away and his people put on a reservation. And he took his winnings from dog sledding and bought the land back for his people, one piece at a time. And he had a champion team of sled dogs and had never lost a race. Well, that didn't worry Willie too much. After all, he had the fastest, strongest, smartest dog in the whole wide world, as far as he was concerned, Searchlight. And Willie was no stranger to sled dog sledding either. He had his own sled. It was small, just his size, and it was lightweight and fast and nimble. And what's more, in the winter months, Searchlight took Willie to and from school. So he knew the route, and he figured he had about as good a chance as anybody of winning. Well, winter came, and it seemed to cover all of Wyoming with a thick blanket of snow. The day before the race, Willie was in town, and who do you think he ran into? Smack dab into Stone Fox, face to face. Howdy, Mr. Stone Fox, he said. My name's Willie. I'm going to be racing against you tomorrow. I know why you want to win. You want to get back the land that was taken from you. 
but I want to win too, to keep the land from being taken from me. You see, if I don't get the prize money and pay the bank, we're going to lose the farm. And Grandpa and me and Searchlight will all have to go someplace else to live. So, you see, I just got to win. But Stone Fox said nothing. He just walked past Willie and went about his business. Well, the next day was the day of the race. The whole town lined up on both sides of Main Street to watch the race. See, the race was kind of a big circle. So it started and ended on Main Street. It started off kind of flat going past farms and fields. And it went around in a big circle. And then just before you get back into town, it went over some very steep mountains that had some very sharp turns. Then it went down and flattened out right back down into town. Well, everybody lined up on the line in the middle of town and bang, the starting pistol went and Willie shot out ahead of everybody. And he stayed ahead for quite a while. But slowly the others started catching up. Those big dog teams started passing him one at a time. First Stone Fox and then several of the others. Willie got worried. Go, Searchlight, go! But she was going just as fast as she could and she couldn't catch up to them until they got to the hills. When they got to those hills, those big dog teams strained and struggled to get those heavy men on their sleds up those steep grades. And the curves, they were so sharp that those long dog teams had a raw hard time getting around them. But not little Willie in searchlight. Why, he just scampered right up those hills and they didn't even have to slow down for the turns. So he passed everybody, even Stone Fox. And by the time they came down the mountain, he had put quite a bit of distance between him and everybody else. He could see the town ahead of him and the finish line. But as he got closer, he glanced over his shoulder and saw that Stone Fox was gaining on him fast. So he encouraged a Searchlight, go girl, go, give it everything you got. And she did. She summoned up every ounce of energy she had. All of her strength went into getting little Willie across that finish line. She was breathing so hard. You could see her breath in the freezing air like steam from a locomotive. Go, Searchlight, go. Even though Stone Fox was gaining on them, Willie could see as they approached the finish line that he was going to pass the finish line first. He was so happy, couldn't believe his good fortune. And then, not more than 10 feet in front of the finish line, something was wrong. Searchlight bowed her head. Then she stumbled and she fell in the snow, motionless. Willie hopped off his sled. He knelt down beside her. He could see right away she was dead. He gently patted her fur and stroked her and he told her in a gentle voice, it's okay, girl. You gave it everything you had. I guess her heart, her great heart had just broken. It burst with the effort. Now you can rest, she, he told her. Well, about this time, he had expected Stone Fox to pass him, but that is not what happened. He turned around and saw that Stone Fox had turned his sled and dog team across the road, blocking it. Then he stepped off his sled and pulled out his rifle, and he fired one shot into the air. Bam! The crowd on both sides of the street hushed silent. All the sledders stopped. Stone Fox faced them and said, nobody pass. You pass, I shoot. And there wasn't one person there that didn't believe him. Then he turned to little Willie and he said, now finish. So Willie scooped up 
searchlight in his arms and carried her across the finish line. And the whole town cheered, hooray for Willie, hooray for Stone Fox. Wonderful story, Walter. I love that story. Thank you so very much for, for sharing it. Okay, so uh, actually now I need to get rid of my spotlight and put it on Bowen. And also the next storyteller. All right, thank you so much. That was an amazing story. It made me, oh my goodness. Thank you so much. Our next storyteller for Asian American Storytellers in Action is Anne Shimojima. She's been telling stories from her Asian heritage and around the world for 40 years at schools, libraries, senior communities, and lately on Zoom. She was a featured teller at the National Storytelling Festival in 2017 and has twice been a teller in residence at the International Storytelling Center in Tennessee. She often tells her family's World War II incarceration camp story, Hidden Memory, and you can hear some of her favorite Japanese folk tales on her award-winning CD, Sakura Tales, Stories from Japan. Here is Anne Shimojima giving us the story, The Gifts of Walidad. Okay, I'm waiting to be, to have Bowen go away. Does everyone just see me? I see Bowen and me. Okay, I'll just go then. <laughs> Hi everybody, I'm glad to be here. Now normally I like to tell stories from Japan, the country that my grandparents came from over a hundred years ago. But today I'm going to do something different. I'm going to tell a story from India, a folktale. Long ago, there was an old man who was a basket maker. His name was Wali Dad, and he lived all alone in a small hut near the river. He spent his days making baskets and he would sell them to a traveling merchant who came by every few months. The merchant would pay Wally Dodd with silver coins, but Wally Dodd rarely spent the money. He caught fish in the river, he grew vegetables in the garden, he rarely spent a single coin. He would throw them into a bag under his bed. But after 50 years of making baskets, he had a lot of coins and one day he decided to count the money. He could barely drag the bag out from under the bed. It was so heavy, and when he had counted the money, he sat there in dismay. What was he going to do with all this money? He sat and thought until he had a plan. The next time the traveling merchant came, the two friends sat together over a pot of tea, and Wally Dodd asked his question. Tell me, he said, what is the name of the most virtuous young lady you have met on your travels? The merchant thought, well, that would have to be the princess of Kaistan. She is beautiful and charming as well. Good, said Wally Dodd, then would you do me a favor? Please take this money, buy a jade bracelet, and give it to the princess and say that it comes from one who admires virtue far more than he cares for money. Well, the merchant was always glad to help his friend, and so he took the money, bought the jade bracelet, and when next he was in Kaistan, he gave it to the princess with Wally Dodd's words. The princess was delighted to receive it. When the merchant was in the courtyard with his horse getting ready to leave, the princess came walking out of the palace. She said, I would like to give something back to the man who has given me the bracelet, and she pointed to a very large horse laden down with many rolls of beautiful silk cloth thought the merchant. So he took the horse and silk cloth to Wally Dodd. Wally Dodd said, no, I cannot use this silk cloth. Look at me. I wear simple cotton clothing. Hmm. Tell me, he said, what is the name of the most generous young man you have met on your travels? Well, said the merchant, that would have to be the Prince of Nicobod. 
The people under his rule are the happiest people in the world. Good, said Wally Dye. Then would you please take this silk to the prince? And take a few rolls for yourself for your trouble and take the rest to the prince and say that it comes from one who admires a generous heart. Well, the merchant had no great objection, and so he went off to see the prince, and he gave the silk to the prince with Wally Dodd's words. The prince was happy to receive the gift. When the merchant was in the courtyard getting ready to leave, the prince came out of his palace and said, I would like to give something back to the man who has sent me the silk, and he showed the merchant 12 fine horses. Hmm, thought the merchant, this is interesting, and he took the horses to Wally Dodd. Wally Dodd said, no, no, I cannot keep all these horses. I cannot house them. I cannot feed them. I know, he said, take them to the princess. She'll like that. Take two horses for yourself, my friend, and take the rest to the princess. So the merchant, he was doing rather well with all these transactions. He had no great objection. He went off to see the princess. Now, the princess was getting a little bit puzzled at all these gifts coming from someone she had never met. So she decided to send back a gift that was could not be topped. For each horse, she sent back two donkeys laden with silver. The merchant took all this to Wally Dodd. Wally Dodd said, no, the point of this was to get rid of the money. Take it to the prince. Take a donkey with silver for yourself and take the rest to the prince. So the merchant went off to see the prince. Now the prince was getting very perturbed at all these gifts coming from a total stranger. So he decided to send back a gift that was so grand it would put an end to the whole business. He sent back 20 elephants, 20 camels, and 20 horses with fine saddles. I don't know how the merchant ever got all of this back to Wally Dodd, but somehow he did. And Wally Dodd stared at all the animals. No, no, no. Take them to the princess, he said. So the merchant managed to get all of these to the princess. The princess and her father stood in the courtyard staring at all the animals with their mouths open. Finally, her father said, my dear, I think it's clear. The man who sends you all these gifts wants to marry you. What do you say? To which the princess could only reply, she would like to meet the man first before making her decision. Good, said her father. We'll go to meet this man by the river. And you, he said to the unfortunate merchant, you will take us there. We'll leave in two weeks time. What could the merchant do but agree? When he was in the courtyard getting ready to leave, the princess came walking out of the palace. She was carrying a large package. She smiled and blushed prettily and said, please give this to the man who sends all the gifts and tell him I hope he wears it at our first meeting. The merchant rode straight to Wally Dodd. He said, Wally Dodd, we are ruined. The princess and her father are coming here to meet you. They think you want to marry her. Oh no, said Wally Dodd, when she comes here and sees me, an old man, and my ugly hut, she will think a trick has been played upon her. I can think of only one thing to spare her this shame. I must die. Oh no, said the merchant, we must think of something. But they could think of nothing. Finally, the merchant said, well, she sends you this gift. She hopes you'll wear it at your first meeting. Wally Dodd opened the package to discover a beautifully embroidered coat such as a young man might wear. He said, oh no, I could never wear this. Take it to the prince and he would say no more. So the merchant took the coat to the prince and he was so distraught that he told the prince the entire story which ended with an old man sitting by the side of the river wishing he could die. Well, said the prince, I don't think I'll send a gift, but my advice to you is to take the princess and her father to see Wally Dodd. Perhaps something will happen to save you all. And since the merchant could think of no better idea, he rode off to Kaistan. Meanwhile, Wally Dodd sat by the river, too poor to make preparations for his guests, too sad to do his basket work. He sat there day after day, and then 
One day he looked down the road and he saw a procession, men on horseback pulling wagon after wagon, and at the very front a handsome young man riding a big black horse. The young man rode up to Wally Dodd, jumped off his horse and said, you must be Wally Dodd. I am the Prince of Nechabod and I have come to help you. Wally Dodd said, but what can you do? Look at me, look at my ugly hut. The prince smiled. Ah, Wally Dodd, he said, look yourself. And Wally Dodd looked over to see the men getting off their horses. They were unpacking the wagons. They were taking out building materials and, and golden dishes and fine wines. So a few days later, when the merchant arrived with the princess, her father, and a heavy heart, to his amazement, he saw a beautiful little pavilion with a gilded roof. And standing on the veranda in front was Wally Dodd wearing a new robe and the prince wearing the coat embroidered by the princess. The prince and the princess met and fell immediately in love. Her father gladly gave consent to the marriage and the wedding was held at once. When it was over, the prince went to Wally Dodd and said, Wally Dodd, you have brought us so much happiness. I want to do something for you. I want to leave you with money and servants to care for you. But Wally Dodd said, no, what would I do with servants or money? Take down the pavilion. Let me go back to my simple life. So the prince reluctantly agreed. But later on, when the princess and Wally Dodd were saying their goodbyes by the side of the road, the prince snuck into the old man's hut and hid a sack of coins under the bed. Thank you, thank you, wonderful story. Thank you very much. Okay, the next storyteller is Ron Chick. And Ron Chick has been, act, he actively participates in many storytelling groups in Southern California and even some outside of California. He loves to tell stories. And he joined the Inland Valley Storytellers in 2010 and has performed in every Inland Valley Storytellers concert since the spring of 2010. And today is the first of three celebrations that he is participating in this year. You have to unmute. Did that work? No. That worked. That worked. We can hear you. Ah. Yeah. You know, it's an interesting situation here where I had originally intended to tell my version of Wally Dodd, hey, but chose a different story when I thought that this might be happening. So I'm going to tell you the Doug Lipman tale of perception at the top of the story, at the top of the sand dune. Long ago, there were people living in a land they considered holy and wonderful, but times were difficult and so they were forced to leave. And many generations later, tales of the holy land that they had left had circulated amongst them and they had a man who was known far and wide as a man of God. And he went to the people and said, we have done well in this city. We should journey back to the holy land and give thanks for our wealth and activities and show our devotion to God. Hey, this was met with great enthusiasm and preparations were rapidly made. Caravan animals were acquired, people gathered gifts and things that they were going to take. But a few days before the journey was to commence, the man of God called his people together and said, my people, I have just heard that there are brigands, bandits, that rob groups such as ours as they cross the great desert. Some of the people said, we are not warriors. Eh? We have swords, but is there not some other defense? Just one. Nothing moves across the great desert that doesn't raise a great cloud of dust. 
If we see a cloud of dust in the distance and we are careful and vigilant, we can hide behind a sand dune okay? and perhaps they will pass us by. And with this assurance, the journey was commenced and they traveled for quite some days. And then in the distance, they saw what they had been fearing right along. Okay? Coming toward them was a dust cloud Scarcely daring to breathe, slowing down to next to nothing, they crept behind a big sand dune and waited and watched. As the dust cloud came closer and closer and closer and stopped right on the other side of the sand dune they were hiding behind. The man of God said, my people, I have brought you here. It is up to me to see what is on the other side. And taking none with him, he began the arduous climb up the side of the sand dune. As he was reaching the top, he saw coming toward him a man climbing up the sand dune from the other side. He hailed a greeting to him, but the man spoke not some other language at him. And so they met at the top of the sand dune. The preacher looked at him and smiled and then reached down and drew a circle in the sand, by which he meant we are all part of one world. The stranger looked down at his circle for a moment, grinned slightly, and drew a line to the circle. What could he mean? Hey, oh, of course. Hey, there are two worlds, the physical and the spiritual. And to show him that I understood, I pointed to the sky. The other man looked at my finger, looked at me, and backed up just a little, then reached into his pocket and pulled out an onion. What could he mean? Oh, of course, the multiple layers of understanding available to all of us. And with that, I ate the onion to show him I understood. Then I reached into my robe and brought out a rare gift for this part of the world. I handed, tried to hand him an egg. He looked at my egg for a few moments, but he was too humble to accept my gift. And he turned and went down the sand dunes. Oh, my people, I have just met the holiest of holies, the top of the sand dune. Now, on the other side, the leader of that group rushed to his men and said, get ready to flee. Hey, this is the most bloodthirsty band that has ever crossed the desert. When we came at each other, it was obvious we didn't speak in the same language, and the man drew a circle in the sand to show that we were surrounded. Well, not to be so easily outdone, I threw a line through his circle to say that we would cut them to pieces. And then he held up one finger to say he'd take us all on by ourselves. Not to be quite so easily undone, I pulled out an onion to show him that he would soon taste the bitter tears of defeat. And he ate the onion. And then he pulled out an egg to show how fragile our position is. My people, flee, flee, stay away from this group. The group came back out from behind the sun, the sand dune. They could see the dust cloud going away from them. Carefully, they repacked and put things ready to go and went around and continued on their way to their holy land. And there they saw the temples and they saw the relics and they conferred with the people and they sang their praises and we hey, worshiped and then returned across the great desert. But the word had gone out and no band bothered them. And for years and years after that, the people talked to the things they had seen and the joy of their journey. But what they most liked to talk about was the time their godly man had met the holiest of holies at the top of the sand dune. That's wonderful, John.
Thank you so much. Or excuse me, wonderful, uh, Ronald. <clears throat> and thanks for that story. Our next storyteller, Toby Ishii Anderson, was a Peace Corps volunteer and international school teacher. And she's lived in various countries in Asia and Europe. She's had the fortunate means of gathering stories from many diverse cultures and turning them into adventures, hmm, much like the one we just heard from Ron. She is now a cl rock climbing, fly fishing, storytelling grandma who has made Olympia, Washington her home. Toby is a member of the Asian American Storytellers in Action and the South Sound Story Guild. Her story? <laughs> comes from Japan called Momoko and the Taiko Drum. As Bowen said, this is a story from Japan and it is a story about a family of Taiko drum makers. Taiko drums are drums from Japan. They're small or medium or absolutely gigantic and they are played with bachi or drumsticks. And as my grandmother would always start a story with Mukashi Mukashi long ago in Japan, there was a village. It was a village of artisans, craftspeople, oh, silkworm farmers and taiko drum makers. This village was also situated by a beautiful flowing river. This river gave the village life. In the village was a family of taiko drum makers. It was Obachan, Ojichan, grandmother, grandfather, Okasan, Otosan, mother, father, and their daughter Momoko. Momo, peach, because her cheeks were so pink and peachy. Now every morning Momoko would get up and get the bachi the drumsticks because she and her father would wake up the village. Dong, gong, dong, kara, kara. And then you would hear sounds such as, Sabura, Sabura, wake up, time to get ready for school. Hi, Okasa. Yes, mother. And then the silkworm farmers would go out and pick the delicious, delicate mulberry leaves for their silkworms. Now, back in Momoko's house. There was Uncle Ichiro. He would be out in the Zelkov tree grove, cutting away the trees, taking the trunks and storing them into the storeroom until they were well seasoned. Then he would find one that was ready and just chisel away at it to make it hollow. And to Shizu, she would take sheets of leather hide and put them into that river to soak for weeks. And when the leather hide was soft and pliable, she would then take it over to Momoko's father, who would then <clears throat> drape it over the hollow tree trunk. Then with pulleys and ropes, have that hide nice and taut. And once in a while, we we'll listen to the sound when it was ready, he and Momoko would take these great big black tacks called byo and hammer them into the drum to secure the hide. When the drums were ready, well, it was time for the festival, Matsuri. All the villagers would come wear their summer kimonos, the drums would be beating, and they would be dancing to Kiga. Deta, deta. It was a wonderful time. There was one summer, though. The climate changed. The wind and the weather so hot. The sun was so thirsty. It drank all the water from the river. The river was bone dry. The thing is though, no water, no mulberry leaves for the silkworms and the Zelkov tree grove suffered. Not only that though, the stale 
air blew its bad breath into the village carrying disease. And many of the villagers died. Momoko's mother and father became very sick and they passed away. Oh, Momoko, she was, she was so sad. She was so distraught. But her grandmother would say, Momoko-chan, kaman de shone. You need to bear up to this pain. Oh, it was hard for her. The villagers were suffering though. With no water, the crops were failing. So they went to visit the mayor. Mayor said, what are we going to do? I will go to the top of the hill and consult the Shinto priest. He will know what to do. And so off he went. Now, the Shinto priest came down the hill and he assessed the situation. Ma, ma, kawakami ga kanashi desho ne. The river gods are very displeased. They are very unhappy. Mm, mm. You will need to give up something that is very precious to you to satisfy the gods. So the villagers went home. And there it was, Taro-san, Taro-san, he went home and there he took his samurai sword. <sighs> so shiny and sharp, eh? <laughs> it could chop a tree in half. <laughs> and he put it back in the sheath. <laughs> they don't mean that thing. No, not that sword. His neighbor, Tomoko-san, she opened the closet door and oh, took out this beautiful antique bolt of silk. Oh, purple in color and da -da 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 -da. she threw it onto the ground. Oh, it's so soft. And quickly wrapped it up and threw it into the closet. They don't mean that old thing. It's <laughs> full of holes when it went on and on like that. It was one night though, Momoko, she just woke up. Eh? Eh? She felt this breeze on her ear, like a whisper. Momoko-chan! Okasa! Mother! Mother, are you here? Momoko-chan, you know what you need to do. Oh, Okasa, oh mother, I miss you so much. And she got out of her bed, the futon, which is on the floor, and she made her way into her parents' lonely room, where she saw on the tansu, which is the dresser drawer, the two drumsticks, bachi, that had been in her family for generations. And she knew what she had to do. She went into the kitchen where the cooking amber's coals were very, very low. She took the sticks and threw them into the ambers and whoosh, the fire just shot up, almost touching the roof and came down. And when the soft ashes had cooled, she scooped them up in her hand, put him in a pouch, and off she went outside. <sighs> there she stood on the edge of the riverbank, took a handful of that ash and threw it up into the air. It just scattered all over and was sucked up by the wind, which swirled it around and went in all directions. Now that next morning, the mayor uh, woke up. Uh, eh? What, what is that sound I, I hear? Eh? And he quickly opened his door. Huh? What's the sound of the river? Eh? And he went outside 
and there were all the villagers gathered around. When he arrived, <clears throat> they parted way and, huh? Huh? Momoko-chan? There was Momoko standing on the edge of that river, looking at that beautiful water as it was flowing by. And then the mayor knew what she had done. Now that night, Momoko was with her grandmother and grandfather and they're, they're eating their rice and the pickles and tea when ba 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 huh? Who could that be? Oh, grandma, grandpa, I'll tend to this. Dare desu who, Who's out there? Eh? What is this? And she picked up two beautifully carved bachi drumsticks, which then stayed in her family for generations. Dong, gong, dong, kara, kara. Thank you very much. That was wonderful. Thank you. Great story. Okay, uh, the next storyteller is uh, Adrienne Lowry. Adrienne Lowry joined the Inland Valley Storytellers in 2011 and has performed in every Inland Valley Storyteller concert this since then. So she has lots of experience in celebration concerts and we are eager to hear what she is going to tell us today. Take it away, Adrian. Thank you. Oh, okay. Oh. Yeah, you, we got your audio. Okay, good. Thanks. <clears throat> well, Tiki Poo was a small grub of a thing, but he had a true love of art. Deep down in his soul, there it hung, mewing and struggling to work its way to the raw exterior that bound it. Tiki Poo's master professed to be an artist. <clears throat> he had apprentices and students who came daily to work for him in a large studio littered about with the performances of himself and his pupils. On the walls also hung a few works by real masters, older painters, all long since dead. Tiki Poo swept the studio, <clears throat> ground the colors for the painters, uh, for the apprentices, wash brushes, and brought them food. He himself fed mainly on the breadcrumbs, which the students screwed into eraser pellets for their drawings and then threw on the floor. It was on this floor, too, that Tiki Poo slept at night. As Tiki Poo squatted on the floor, <clears throat> grinding the color powders, his soul would come down into his fingers. Oh, the yellow and the greens, the reds, and the cobalts, the purples, which sprang from the blending of them. It was all he could do to keep himself from crying out loud. At other times, he would listen to the master lecturing the students. He knew by heart the names of all the painters in their schools, and especially the great leader of them all, who had lived and passed from their midst more than 300 years ago. He knew that name, like the sound of the wind, Wiyawani. The big picture at the end of the studio was by him. That picture. To Tiki Poo, it was worth all the rest of the world put together. <clears throat> Wiyawani, at the end of a long life, had painted it a garden full of trees and sunlight with high standing flowers and green paths and in their midst, a palace. The palace where I would like to rest, said Riawani when he was finished. So beautiful it was that the emperor himself had come to see it, gazing enviously at the peaceful walks and the palace nestled among the trees. Then Wiyawani stepped into the picture and walked away down the path, growing smaller as he went farther down. He came to a low door in the palace wall. Opening it, he turned and beckoned the emperor to follow him, but the emperor did not. Wiyawani went in by himself and shut the door between himself and the world 
forever. That was 300 years ago, but for Tiki Poo, the story was as fresh as yesterday. When he was by himself in the studio locked up for the night, he would stare at the little palace door into which Weawani had disappeared. Then his soul would go down into his fingertips and he would knock softly and fearfully at the beautifully painted door, saying, Weawani, are you there? Little by little in the long thinking nights, Tiki Poo's soul became too much for him. He would mount one of his candles on a wooden stand and paint by its light until dawn. Tiki Poo was well pleased with the results and believed he was doing very well. If only Weawani were here to teach me, I would be on my way to becoming a great painter. And thus he decided Weawani should teach him. Sitting down opposite Weawani's back door, he began painting. He did his best by the dim candlelight, but was nearly driven to despair. How, how the trees stood row behind row with sunlight between, and how the path went in and out, winding its way to the little door in the palace wall. These were mysteries he could not fathom. One night, the door in the palace wall opened, and out came a little old man who walked down the path toward him. The soul of Tiki Poo gave a sharp leap in his grubby little body. That must be Weowani himself, he cried, pulling off his cap and throwing himself to the floor with reverent groveling. When he dared to look up, Weowani stood over him just within the edge of the canvas, holding out his hand. Come along with me, Tiki Poo, said the great one. If you want to know how to paint, I will teach you. I have been watching you out of my little window. Come along in. Tiki Poo took a heave and swung himself into the picture, his feet capering among the flowers in Weowani's beautiful garden. Oh, celestiality, may I speak, he said suddenly. Weowani nodded. The emperor, was he not the very flower of fools not to follow you when you told him? I cannot say, smiled Weowani, but he certainly was no artist. Then he opened the door that he had so beautifully painted in the castle wall and led Tiki Poo inside. Outside in the dark studio, the candle end guttered by itself until the wick fell over and the flame kicked itself out. The studio sat in darkness until the growing dawn. It was full day before Tiki Poo reappeared, running down the green path in haste, jumping out of the frame onto the studio floor. Quickly, he tidied up his mess and had everything ready, just in time for the master to return to the studio. All day long, Weawani's words tickled Tiki Poo's ears and he watched the apprentices as if from a great distance. Tiki Poo's master soon noticed a change in him. Though he bullied him and thrashed him, did all that a careful master should do, he could not get the change out of him. <clears throat> he grew suspicious. He saw nothing wrong all day. It must be at night that he gets into mischief. That night, when it was dark, the master stood outside the studio and soon saw the faint light of the guttering candle through the window. Poking a hole in the rice paper pane, he peered inside. There, <clears throat> he saw Tiki Poo, squatting with paint pots and brush before Weowani's last masterpiece. What serpent is this, the master asked himself. Is this grub of a boy thinking to make himself a painter and cut me out of my reputation and prosperity? Even at this distance, he could plainly see that the boy's work was head and shoulders beyond his or any other living painter. At that moment, Weawani opened the door on the castle wall and came down the path, as was his habit each night, to call Tiki Poo to his lesson. He came to the edge of the painting and beckoned for Tiki Poo to come with him. Tiki Poo's master trembled as he saw Tiki Poo catch hold of Weawani's hand and jump into the picture. 
skipping up the green path by Weawani's side and disappearing into the little door Weawani had painted so beautifully in the palace wall. <clears throat> Tiki Poo's master stood frozen with grief and horror. You little parasite. You vampire. You fly in amber. Is that where you get your training? His rage built. Is that where you dare to go trespassing into a picture that I purchased for my own pleasure and profit and not at all for yours? We'll just see whom it belongs to. Pushing his way into the studio, he took up paint pot and brush and sacrilegiously set himself to work upon Weowani's masterpiece. In place of the doorway by which Tiki Poo had entered, he painted a solid brick wall. Twice over, he painted it, two bricks thick. Brick by brick, he painted it and mortared every brick in the palace. Then he finished. He laughed and called, <laughs> Good night, Tiki Poo, and went home to be happy. The apprentices soon wondered what had become of Tiki Poo, but since the master said nothing, they hired another boy to grind the colors and wash brushes, and everyone forgot about Tiki Poo. <clears throat> the master sat at work, and with the students all about him, content with himself. Now and then he would glance at the bricked up doorway and laugh to himself. He had justly served Tiki Poo for his treachery and presumption. One day, five years after Tiki Poo had disappeared, the master was giving his apprentices a lecture on the glories and wonders of Weowani's painting. Now, nothing equaled it in color and mastery. Suddenly, he stopped midward and broke off in the full flight of his eloquence. He saw something like a small hand reach out and take down the top brick from the face of the paint which the master had laid over the little door in the palace wall which Weowani had painted so beautifully soon brick by brick the wall was being pulled down in spite of its double thickness <clears throat> the master was too terrified to utter a word and his apprentices soon just stared with while the demolition of the wall proceeded Soon, he recognized Weowani with his long, flowing white beard. It was he who pulled down the wall. He still had a brick in his hand when he stepped through the opening he had made, and close behind him came Tiki Poo. Tiki Poo had grown tall and strong, even handsome. <clears throat> his old master recognized him and grew envious as he saw that Tiki Poo carried many rolls and stretchers and portfolios of paintings he must have done over the years under Weowani's teaching. He was coming back into the world to be a great painter. They grew larger as they came down the garden path into the foreground of the picture. How big the brick in Weowani's hand and how angry he looked. He came right down to the edge of the picture frame and held up the brick. What did you do that for? He demanded. Tiki Poo's old master was beginning to deny it, and while the lie was still rolling off his tongue, Weowani hurled the brick at him. The lying painter turned and ran, never to be seen again. Just inside the picture frame, Tiki Poo kissed the wonderful hands of Weowani, which had taught him all their skill. Goodbye, Tiki Poo, said Weowani, embracing him tenderly. Now I am sending my second self into the world. When you're tired and want rest, come back to me. Old Weowani will take you in. Kiki Poo, tears running down his cheeks, stepped out of Weowani's wonderfully painted garden and stood once more upon the earth. Turning, he saw the old man walking away along the path toward the little door under the palace wall. At the door, Weowani turned and waved his hand for the last time. Tiki Poo stood watching him. Then the door opened and shut, and Weowani was gone. Softly as a flower, the picture seemed to have folded its leaves over him. 
Tiki Poo leaned a wet face against the picture and kissed the door in the palace wall, which Weowani had painted so beautifully. Oh, Weowani, dear master, he cried, are you there? He waited and called again, but no voice answered. And so he turned to the apprentices and like a flower in Weowani's garden, he unfolded to them all that he had learned. <clears throat> yes. Oh, I was supposed to say something about <laughs> spotlight. Well, thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Adrian, for that story. And I guess it's my turn to tell a story. <laughs> All right, here I am, folks. <clears throat> All right, so um, the story of Hua Mulan is very ancient. The first written um, story about Hua Mulan came from the third century AD. It's a Chinese poem called The Poem of Hua Mulan. And before then, people used to tell this story in traditional ways as an oral story. Wa means flower. Mulan means a herder of some kind, maybe sheep, maybe goats, maybe deer, because in the steppes of Mongolia and Kazakhstan, there were deer herders. So some people say that Wa Mulan comes from Mongolia, some say Kazakhstan. These semi nomadic people would teach their children how to ride as soon as they could walk. And both boys and girls were taught the five weapons, the sword, the spear, the lance, um, the battle ax, and how to shoot arrows on horseback. So um, it was expected that men and women would defend the village when there were invaders. So after the poem of Wa Mulan, there was the song of Wa Mulan. And this song bloomed into a full-fledged Chinese opera. From the opera came theater, Mulan on stage, and then Mulan on film. Recently, <clears throat> we have had many modern versions of Mulan on film. Disney made two movies. So um, how has the story lasted for 20,000 years? Everybody, I guess, enjoys the story of a true hero. Sigh and sigh and sigh again. Mulan sat at the loom weaving but her mind was not on her weaving. She was not looking at the shuttle going through the loom. Her thoughts were far away. Mulan, who are you thinking of? Who has stolen your heart? But it was not a boy Mulan was thinking of. She had been to the market and she had seen the lists of men inscripted into the Khan's army to fight against the bandits. 12 lists in all, and on every list, her father's name. Mulan thought, my father is too old and I have no older brother. My, my older sister, she is to be married soon. And my little brother is just a child. There is no one to take my father's place, but my father cannot go to war. If he does, he will never return. But I, 
I know how to use a sword. And I can ride a horse and my arrows never miss. Mulan went to the marketplace. In the Eastern market, she bought a horse. In the Western market, she bought a saddle. In the Northern market, she bought a bridle. And in the Southern market, she bought a whip. In the morning, she took off her dress. She removed her makeup. She put on her armor and her helmet. She bade goodbye to her parents and she rode off to join the army. For many Lee, she went all the way down to the Yellow River and at the Yellow River, she did not hear her mother crying. All she heard was the water rushing against the rocks. She rode many li all the way to the Black Mountains. And at the Black Mountains, she did not hear her father calling. Only the sound of the enemy's horses in the distant hills. Oh, yes, a new recruit. Oh, your name is uh, Mulan. Yes, sir. I have come to take my father's place in the army. Oh, good, good, good. That shows uh, filial piety. Very nice. Uh, you make a good, you're a good son. Oh, have you ever been in battle before, boy? No, sir. Well, you stick with us and you'll pick up a thing or two. Yes, sir. Mulan fought the first battle. She did very well. The second battle, the third battle, she did many battles and she came up outstanding and she rose through the ranks. She needed to rise through the ranks. The higher stature she had in the army, the more privacy she had to be able to keep her identity, to keep her disguise. For she was one woman among thousands of men who were hungry, not just for food. Mulan fought many a battle, first year, second year, third year. The battle raged on and on against the bandits. The Khan's army was vast, but the bandits were clever. Five years, the war went on, 10 years, 12 years. Finally, the Khan's army had pushed the bandits up against the hills. The commander called Mulan. Mulan, uh, we, have a, we have a problem here. The bandit king is in the caves and he refuses to come out. The only way we can flush him out is to send in explosives and blow him up, but we don't want to do that. We have to get him alive. We have to capture him alive and make him surrender. Otherwise, this war will never end. Mulan, you're the only one that we can entrust with this. You must go in and capture that bandit king and bring him back alive. Yes, sir, I will do it. No one knows how she did. But Mulan entered the bandit's cave, captured the bandit king and brought him out alive. The bandit king surrendered and the war was over and everyone celebrated. The Khan called all his commanders into the court. And when Mulan was before him, he said, Mulan, of all my commanders, I have you to be most appreciative of. I'm asking you to stay here at court and be my military advisor. 
your greatness. It has been 12 years since I saw my family. I do not want to stay at court. All I ask is that you give me your fastest steed that I might ride home to my parents. And so Mulan sped across the valleys, the mountains, the steppes, crossed the rivers and came to her parents' village. At her parents' house, they welcomed her, had celebrations, prepared a great feast for her. She went into her old room. She took off her armor. She put on her favorite dress and put on her makeup. She put her hair into the style of a woman. And when she walked outside, her soldier friends from the army who had traveled with her were astonished. Mulan, you're, you're a girl. We've been with you all these years and we had no idea you were a woman. Mulan simply smiled. There are two hairs a male and a female. The male hops about high and the female has eyes that might wander. But when the two are running side by side, who can tell which is a male and which is a female? Thank you. Thank you for the wonderful story, well told. And now I get to introduce John St. Clair. All right, our wonderful host and next storyteller is John St. Clair, who retired in 2010 after teaching for 35 years in the Ontario Montclair School District in Southern California. John made his first public storytelling performance in 2000, sorry, 2003. <coughs> at the first Inland Valley Storytellers Celebration Concert held at the Claremont Forum. And he's performed yearly at every Celebration Concert since then. He has been the leader of the Inland Valley Storytellers since 2007. Oh, Celebration 2023 would, not, would be nothing without our John St. Clair. Take it away, John. I am going to tell an original story called One Tear, written by Dan Ketting, one of my favorite storytellers. And I tell this story with his permission. Long ago, there was a boy who lived in a village, and his job was to take a flock of sheep up into the hills above the village to graze. He took his dog with him, who had watched the sheep, while the boy would take out a small stringed instrument and play and sing songs. You see, the boy loved to listen to the songs in the village square that the old people of the village would sing. And so when he was in the hills with his sheep, he would practice playing and singing those songs. Well, one day he went higher up in the hills than he had ever been before. And he came to a valley filled with lush green grass. After he and his dog had herded the sheep into the valley and they were grazing contentedly, he looked around and he saw one side of the valley had rock cliffs and there was a rock wall there. And at the bottom, it looked like there was an opening. So he decided to go explore. Well, as he got closer, he realized that it was a huge cave. And he thought this would be useful if there was a storm. Maybe it's big enough. I could fit my flock of sheep in there to shelter. So he went inside the cave to see how big it was, but he never found out because it got dark before he reached the end. And so he couldn't see anything. He turned around and went back out. And there at the opening of the cave was a large rock, just the right size for sitting on. So the boy took out his stringed instrument and he started playing and singing the village songs. After about 30 minutes, he decided he was hungry. So he put down his instrument 
opened up his lunch and began to eat. Suddenly, a voice came out of the cave. Play another one! Well, this startled the boy, and, and he was frightened. So he, he put away his lunch and, and picked up his instrument, and he was about ready to run away when the voice from the cave spoke again. Please, please play another song. Well, this time the voice did not sound so threatening, and the boy relaxed. He sat down on the rock, and he played and sang another song. And when he finished, the voice from the cave told a story. It was a wonderful story. And when the story was finished, the boy played another song. And then the voice told another story. And so it went for the rest of the day until it was time for the boy to take his sheep back to the village. And as he got ready to leave, the voice from the cave said, will you come back and visit me again? And the boy said, yes, yes, this was fun. And so the boy took the sheep back and he came back every day to that valley and spent the day playing and singing songs and listening to stories. And they were wonderful stories, stories of knights in shining armor, stories of battles and valor, stories of love, sad stories, happy stories, stories of promises kept and promises broken. Well, one day, the boy stayed longer than usual, and, and the sun was getting lower in the western sky. And since the cave faced west, the sun's rays began to creep into the cave so the boy could see who was telling the stories. First, the sun's rays glistened on the razored sharp claws. Then, illuminated tree trunk sized legs, and then the long green body covered with scales with the brown leathery wings folded up on the side, and then a serpent-like neck. And finally, the boy could see the head with two horns and smoke coming out of the nose. The boy was looking at a dragon. And as the dragon told his stories, he had come to a personal story about his own life, and he had his eyes closed. And this was a sad story. The dragon was talking about how he was now the only one of his kind left, and he was lonely in that cold, dark cave, and he was afraid of dying all alone in that cave. And as the dragon was telling the sad story, the boy walked into the cave, and just as the dragon finished that sad personal story, the boy put his hand on the dragon's side to comfort him. The dragon's eyes opened violently and said, aren't you afraid of me? No, said the boy, I'm not afraid of you. Don't you know I could tear you to pieces with my razor sharp claws? The boy giggled. Don't you know I could burn you to a crisp? The boy laughed. Why aren't you afraid of me? I can't be afraid of you, said the boy. I've heard your story. And the dragon smiled a toothy smile and said, will you still come back here even though you know I'm a dragon? Of course, said the boy. And he did. Well, one day, the boy asked the dragon if maybe he could move into the village with him so he wouldn't have to live all alone in that cold, dark cave. And the dragon said, oh, no, 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 that won't work. Your people and my people have been killing each other for thousands of years. If I came into your village, your men would grab their spears and swords and bows and arrows and they'd attack me. No, 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 that won't work. Well, said the boy, I'm going to try to figure out a way to make it work. A couple of days later, he was in the village square and he was listening to the old people in the village sing their songs. And in between the songs, one of the singers said, isn't it sad? how nobody ever comes to visit our village anymore. Yes, said another singer. And we have such beautiful songs, but now they all go down to that town by the river. We, we never get visitors. And the boy had an idea. He quickly got up and he ran to the mayor's house and knocked on the door. The mayor opened the door. What do you want? And the boy said, is it true that nobody ever comes to visit this village? Yeah, said the mayor, it, it's so sad. They all go down to that town by the river. They never come here. Well, said the boy, I have an idea to get to people to start coming back to visit our village. Oh, really, said the mayor, what? 
I know the best storyteller in the world. He could bring people back to our village. That's wonderful, said the mayor. Bring your storyteller here and I'll listen to his stories. Uh, no, 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 that won't work. Uh, you see, uh, the, the storyteller is a little shy. It would work better if you came to his place to listen to the stories. Okay, said the mayor, and I could bring the council members with me. And and one more thing, said the boy. Um, when, when we get there, I'm going to need to put blindfolds on you because the, the storyteller is a little self-conscious until he gets to know you. What, said the mayor? Blindfolds? A shy, self-conscious storyteller? That's a strange thing. But... I guess I'll try it. If 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 this storyteller is as good as you say he is, it's 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 worth a try. So a couple of days later, the mayor and the city council members followed the boy with his flock of sheep up into the hills above the village. And when they got to that valley with the lush green grass, and the boy made sure the dog was well in control and the sheep were grazing contentedly. They started towards the cave, but before they got there, the boy had them stop and he put blindfolds on all of them and had them hold hands and walk single file behind him. And he led him the rest of the way to the cave. He sat him down in a semi-circle. So there was a large space open for the dragon to finish the circle. And on one end of the half circle was the boy and on the other end was the mare. After they were all seated, the dragon came out. And he started to tell stories, and they were wonderful stories. Stories of battle and valor that stirred their blood. Stories of love that melted their hearts. Sad stories that made them cry. Happy and funny stories that made them smile and laugh. And finally, the dragon came to his own personal story. And as he was telling the story, he closed his eyes. And when he got to the sad part about being lonely in that cold, dark cave and being afraid of dying by himself, the dragon started crying with his eyes closed. And one of those teardrops fell on the mare's hand. Well, this startled the bear. He thought maybe it was starting to rain. And he, he took off his blindfold and there was the dragon. And so... He quietly went to all the other storytellers, took off their blindfolds and motioned for them to be quiet. And they all gathered together when they all had their blindfolds off and closed the circle up to the dragon. And as the dragon was finishing his sad story, they all placed a hand on the dragon to comfort him. The dragon's eyes shot open. And the mayor said, would you be willing to come to our village and be our official storyteller. Oh, yes, yes, said the dragon. I, that would make me very happy. And the mayor said, I do have one small favor to ask you. Oh, anything, said the dragon. What, what do you want? Will you give us a ride? And so the dragon said, of course. And he made himself as low to the ground as he could. And the, the mayor and the city council members climbed up on the dragon's back and the dragon spread his wings and took off into the air. The boy, of course, had to take his sheep back, so he didn't get a ride. But as the dragon flew down out of the hills, he was not flying high in the air. He was flying low enough so the people on the ground in, in the farms that they were flying over, they could see that on the dragon's back was the mayor and the city council members. And they all stopped what they were doing, started running towards the village. So when the dragon landed in the village square and the mayor and the city council members climbed off his back, people were coming into the village square to see what was going on. Well, the mayor introduced the dragon as the new village storyteller. And he began to tell stories. And they were wonderful stories. Stories of promises kept and promises broken. And soon word of this dragon storyteller started spreading throughout the countryside and people started coming to the village to hear this wonderful storyteller and they even came from long distances so the dragon spent the rest of his years living in that village as their official storyteller and when the time finally came 
for his life to end, he did not die alone in a cold, dark cave. He died surrounded by friends, with his head laying next to his best friend, a man who used to be a boy who sang songs to the dragon. And so all of the fear and all of the hate have been washed away by one tear and replaced with understanding and love helped by the power of story. Thank you. So that concludes our celebration and what a wonderful bunch of stories we heard uh, today. I'm going to stop the recording.